everybody. I think seeing that we're a few minutes past the hour, um, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start off the webinar with a handful of slides just to introduce the software and some of the themes we'll be talking about. And then I'll spend the rest of the time in the software just giving a short demo of the workflows I'm going to go through in the presentation. So a couple of housekeeping things for today. Um, first is if you have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and post them in the chat. I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on it. Sometimes it disappears um, when, as I go through the slides, but I'll do my best to keep an eye on it. And that way I can answer questions um, in real time rather than having to wait until the end. Um, you don't have an ability to unmute. So you know using the raise your hand function isn't going to do much. So just make sure that you put your questions in the chat. Um, I've also put my email here at the very beginning, um, and if you have any questions after the webinar or something is unclear, you need some demo data, um, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'm happy to help with that. Second is this webinar is being recorded, okay, so if you have to jump off early um, or you step away to, to take care of something and you miss a section, uh, don't worry, I'll show you where you can access this recording at the end of the presentation, it'll be on our website, um, so you can rewatch it or watch portions of it. And um, that all being said, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So, you know, you may have noticed by now that we're not going to be talking about Flojo today, but instead we're going to be talking about SeqGeek, um, which is our single cell RNA seq or single cell multiomics analysis platform. Okay, so the idea is to give you an introduction into the software and see if it's going to suit your needs for your area of research. So let's go on to the next slide here. So, you know, with single cell analysis, we're getting, you know, way more data than we've ever been able to before, right? And I like this schematic because it kind of shows the, the burden of having, you know, so much data from so little cells, which is great, um, but also gets to a point where it might be overwhelming for a benchtop scientist to extract some kind of biology from it, right? So we can see that compared to flow cytometry, which needs way more cells, right, we get less measurements than we do with, say, like RNA-seq, and RNA-seq doesn't require um, nearly as many cells, right? So this would be a very, you know, oversimplified schematic just describing a typical experiment, right? So you, you have an, some kind of biological experiment that you run, acquire, or manage as a benchtop scientist, and you decide that you want to do some single-cell RNA-seq on your cells of interest, and ultimately, you need to extract some kind of biological information from there, right? Like we can't just publish a big list of genes without offering some kind of interpretation or some kind of pathway that's been upregulated or downregulated and associated with some kind of a, a pathogenic state or, or a favorable outcome of a therapy. But I think going from the boatloads of data to this discovery point is really the bottleneck in single cell research, right? We typically rely on very knowledgeable, talented bioinformaticians to code these scripts to analyze all of this data for us and get all of those pretty um, heat maps and, and UMAPs and TISNEs that you see in a publication. But there aren't nearly, I think, at least in my opinion and my experience in the research realm, there aren't as many bioinformaticians as there are people waiting to have their single cell RNA-seq data analyzed, right? So at Flojo, we, we wanted to help address this bottleneck, right, and, and be able to take researchers, you know, from point B to point C uh, more quickly, right? So this is where the advent of SeqGeek came from. So this is our single cell RNA-seq analysis platform. So why use SeqGeek instead of something like R, for instance? Well, it's not going to require any scripts or programming knowledge. So if you're like me and you have um, next to no experience writing code or scripts, um, then you'll see that the point and click interface is going to be a lot more intuitive to navigate through because you can actually see your data and interact with it um, instead of writing scripts and having things happen in the background. If you are a Flojo user, it's going to look very familiar, especially as I go through the slides. Right, We're treating a lot of these genes and, and cells in the same way we would with a flow cytometry analysis. It's compatible with a lot if not all single cell acquisition platform matrices. Okay, so you're not limited to necessarily BD related products, right? We, it can handle data, for instance, from the um, 10X platform as well. And it also has multiomic capabilities. So it's not just gonna be um, RNA-seq. If you've incorporated some kind of an ab-seq or a VDJ analysis or anything of that nature um, that's not strictly transcriptomics, uh, we can handle that as well. And at the end, you'll be able to interact with your data 
to generate you know, some of these kind of publication worthy images that we'll be showing throughout the presentation. So let's talk a little bit about navigation, right? What just from a bird's eye view, what does that software look like? Okay, so it all starts with the SeatGeek workspace. So this is going to be your interface to load and analyze your samples. And it's got a couple main sections here. At the top is the activity ribbon. This is where all of the functionality is going to be in the form of buttons organized by tabs. Then beneath that, we have gene sets. So this is going to be a section unique to SeatGeek, right? We don't have gene sets in Flojo because we're not working with genes. We're working with um, cell populations only. But here, we're also working with genes, right? And that'll make more sense later. Um, but once we form those gene sets, this is where they appear. And then the bottom pane is going to look a lot like what you see in Flojo. So you have the sample pane, which is going to have all your individual samples. And then you'll also see any kind of hierarchy analysis that has been applied um, to find populations. And you also have some default statistics, right? So number of events, um, as well as frequency of that population relative to the parent, which is the node that's just above it. So graph windows. So another distinction here from Flojo, right? The, the graph window on the left is going to look pretty much the same as Flojo, right? And then I'll talk about the one on the right and how that's unique to the SeatGeek platform. So in the graph window, this is where you're actually visualizing your data and forming gates. Right? So you'll have an ability to modify what shape of gate, how you're displaying the data, right? Whether it's something like pseudo color or a contour plot, as well as scaling on the axis, right? And the scaling is managed with these T for transform buttons right beside each axis. So the two distinct views have two distinct outcomes, right? So in cell view, which is a lot like flow cytometry, each dot is an event or presumably a cell. When we draw a gate around a group of events, it forms a population, right? And then that population starts to get added to the hierarchy in the sample pane, right? So when I draw a gate around cells, I'm making a population. But with single cell RNA-seq, we're also interested in transcript reads, right? So we also have what's called a gene view. Now in this view, each dot is a gene instead of a cell or event, right? So on each axis, you're setting a population, right? So let's say I have B cells that I've manually gated for and T cells that I've manually gated for. And I'm looking at different genes, right, in those populations and their enrichment towards either population, right? So if it's in the middle, it's not enriched in, in either per se, so they're relatively equal. But if it's closer to one axis or another, then that means it's more characteristic of that population, right? So more enriched there. Okay. So when I draw a gate around genes of interest, that's going to make a gene set, right? So again, each dot is a gene, gate makes a gene set, right? And then that's going to show up in that pane that I showed in the previous uh, navigation window. Um, and so once you have this gene set, it's just what it sounds like. It's a list of genes that you have, you know, essentially curated based on this gate that has been drawn. Okay, so what can you do with these gene sets, right? So talking about these gene sets, right, there's the one, the method we just talked about, which is called an analytic gene set. So an analytic gene set is created from gates when you're in gene view, right? So you can see in this example here, I'm in gene view, each dot is a gene. I became interested in the genes that were up in B cells compared to T cells. So I have that list of genes and I can export it and run it on some kind of web tool or do a, a native gene set enrichment within the software. Okay? And this will use reference gene sets that come with the software or you can import your own, I believe. But regardless of which reference you choose, a gene set enrichment is basically looking at this list of genes and seeing what kind of pathway um, or cell type they're enriched for, right? So in the example here, then I've seen that, oh, this list of genes, when I run a gene set enrichment, um, is actually characteristic of, um, you know, the, these different uh, cell types that are shown here. And you get some statistics for that, um, as well as how many hits out of the total in the reference. Okay? But there's some web tools that you can use for this instead. Now, that's an analytic gene set, right? It's probably the most popular use case for making one. But there might be a situation where you have a static gene set. Now, this is created manually, 
from a list of genes or from an import, right? So for instance, if I have, if I know for sure I'm interested in T-cell lineage genes, I'll just type genes that of interest to me, add them to a list, and then have them handy um, in a particular group, right? So when I'm in gene view or particularly in cell view, if there's uh, genes that I want to see uh, in that moment, I can quickly navigate to them using this gene set that I've created. Okay, so it's just a way to create groups of genes that you're interested in, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they have um, that they're up or down in a particular population that you've found by gating. Um, it just means that you've curated them um, because they're of interest to you. Okay, so again, gene sets are ways to group together genes of interest into a manageable group, whether that's going to be you found it in a discovery-based approach or you found it manually this way. All right, so now that we have kind of the lay of the land, let's talk about a basic workflow, right? So how do I go from adding my files to getting to, you know, basically the hallmark of a single cell analysis, which is differential expression of genes, right? So what, what's all the stuff in between? Well, you're going to need to do a little pre-processing on your data, and we want to help with that. Okay, so we have platforms within the software to kind of get you going and, and do some quality control and normalization on your samples. So for normalization, what we're talking about is adjustment of data to a common scale, right? So if we just take the raw data, for instance, it's going to be hard to make comparisons because some of the samples might have way more reads than others, right? So if I say that one donor had five reads of granzyme, um, but another donor had 10 reads of granzyme, that second donor may just have way more reads in general, right? What if it has 10,000 reads, whereas the previous donor only had 5,000 reads? Right, so it gets hard to make comparisons um, when you have different total read numbers between everything. Right, so what you can do is a normalization to kind of bring them all on the same scale. Right, almost like you're normalizing to frequency. Right, so a, a common normalization technique is counts per ten thousand, uh, but there are some other options. You could do counts per million, or you could do something custom in the platform. But the idea is to just have everything on the same scale. And also bring it more into uh, into view, right? So you might have some reads where you only have one or two reads, and so they're always just going to be slammed on the axis. But if we normalize to something higher, um, then we can kind of get everything within view, right? And then make it a little easier to, to draw gates and interact with the data. Now, after that, then you'll want to do some kind of a quality control, right? So you're going to remove ambiguous or questionable data points, right? So we can really focus on the research at hand. So three main steps for that. First one's going to take place in cell view. And like flow cytometry, we just want to get rid of junk, right? We want to remove outlier events that could represent empty wells or doublets. Okay, So if we see cells that have um, you know, a large library size and a lot of genes expressed compared to the rest of the population, right? That could be cells that kind of got stuck together during the you know, single cell processing protocol. Um, and, and the converse can be true, right? So if we have a smaller library size, right? Cells are expressing less genes than the rest of the cells, right? Those could be cells that ruptured or it could just be a completely empty well. And this is just debris, right? So we want to grab, you know, where, um, you know, the majority of the norm lies, right? Where most of the data is going to be quality cells. So cells that are single cells and haven't ruptured. Now, the next two steps are more so filters to kind of focus on genes of interest, right? Especially if you've done um, a whole transcriptome analysis and you didn't use some kind of a specified targeting panel. Um, so there, when you're doing sequencing, sometimes you can only sequence um, certain families of genes because you have a very specific question, or you do a whole transcriptome analysis and you basically sequence everything. And particularly with the latter, you are just going to get a lot of data. Um, and, and some of it is, is not going to give you new information, so we don't want to focus on it and funnel it to downstream analyses. So we can apply two filters to help with that. First filter in gene view again, so each of these dots represents a gene, we're basically looking at total reads over cells expressing, right? And we want a sweet spot kind of in the middle. Essentially what's happening on this plot is we want to try to exclude events that, or I should say exclude genes, that are expressed by all the cells, right? So that's going to be towards the top. And really that's because those could possibly be just housekeeping genes, 
um, or something that we're not really interested in. Converse is true for the bottom, right? We don't want genes that are expressed by very few cells or too few cells because those could just be, you know, anomalies, um, kind of just blips in the in the majority of the data that are going to add noise. Um, and they could also be maybe mitochondrial genes or apoptotic genes for cells that aren't in great shape by the end of the sequencing run. So sweet spot's going to be somewhere in the middle, right? We want genes expressed by most of the cells, but not every single cell and not very few cells, okay? Now, the great thing about this gate is you can adjust it in real time, right, and watch your gene sets, and I'll show you how to do that. And, and that way you can always, if you change your mind and you want to be more or less strict, you can do that. Last cleanup is going to be to zone in on genes that have kind of a high variance in expression, right? So when we talk about dispersion, we mean variability and level of expression, right? So we want to focus on genes that show a lot of variability between different cell types, right? So if there's genes that are expressed at the same level across all of my cells, those are probably going to be less interesting, right? We're looking for differential gene expression, so I want to focus in on genes that show variability between cells. Um, so this is going to be another filter, and much like the filter before, right, you can always make it more or less strict. This is just a, a gate, right? So you can always adjust that gate if you change your mind. Now, after you've done some cleanup, um, you're going to move into some kind of computational analysis, um, which is really not optional for single cell um, data of this magnitude, right? So, you know, you could you could draw gates around genes and cells all day long, um, but that's going to be a lot of data to go through and visualize differences. So you'll ultimately have to take it through some kind of computational pipeline. All right. So imagine this is your data, right? There's maybe four different samples, in my case, four different very large jars of jelly beans. And I have to go through each of these jars and figure out, you know, how many pink jelly beans are in there, how many black, how many purple. Um, that's going to be a lot to do by hand. But if we do something where we can kind of lay out all of our data nice and flat and segregate them by similarity, then it becomes a little bit easier of a task to digest, right? In this view, it's easier for me to see how many pink, how many red, how many kind of robin egg colored jelly beans there are versus looking at them and then the view that we have on the left, okay? And so that's basically in a nutshell, what dimensionality reduction and clustering do for us, right? Dimensionality reduction lays out everything relatively flat so we can visualize differences. Clustering forms hard gates around populations so that that are populations that are similar to one another. Um, so that way we can interrogate them separately. So what's available for dimensionality reduction in SeqGeek? Okay, so again, this is a tool to compress your entire data set into a two-dimensional space. TISNI is probably the most popular um, within SeqGeek, right? So this is T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Um, but there are others out there in the form of plugins. Okay, so these are not natively available in SeqGeek. You have to install a plugin from our website. Um, but they are freely available. Okay, so some of you may be familiar with UMAP, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. Um, but there have been some new developments in dimensionality reduction techniques, and we try to keep up with the literature and incorporate those for you all. But regardless of which method you choose, you're, you're ultimately going to end up with something like this, right? where you're getting a two-dimensional rendering of your single cell data, where like attracts like, right? So events that are more similar in their transcriptomic profile are going to group together and be typically more distant from those that are more different from that population. And so you can see an example of that here, where I'm looking at CD19 expression, which ends up in this island here. And if I look to the neighboring graph of CD14, right, that CD19 island doesn't have CD14, and I wouldn't expect it to, right? We're talking about possibly monocytes and B cells. But you can see I have two other hotspot islands of CD14, and similarly for CD3 and CD4. And so this is ultimately what you're trying to accomplish with the dimensionality reduction. Um, I'll also mention we have two other techniques available in SeqGeek as well. So there's principal component analysis and uh, linear discriminant analysis. But I would say these are a bit more antiquated, um, and usually they're kind of a means to get to one of the other dimensionality reduction techniques. Um, so it's a pre-compression with these tools, and then you 
pre add that pre-compressed data into the other tools. And I'll show you how to do that in the software, but just know they're there if those are your favorite. Um, but we also have uh, more updated techniques as well. Okay, so once you have a visualization, right, you're ultimately going to want to look for populations. Okay, so the dimensionality reduction is strictly a visualization tool. Right? It's not encouraged to draw gates on that visualization to look for your populations, but rather to look for them manually or use a clustering technique. So clustering is going to be the unsupervised identification of populations. There's a proof of concept paper here for one of the published clustering tools called Phenograph. But long story short, in the paper, you can see they've demonstrated that the populations that are found automatically with this tool, right, which correspond to these numbers, um, typically match populations that one could find manually based on uh, known phenotypes from the literature. Right? So you can see that what are the 15 populations found by Phenograph um, could kind of correspond to um, a variety of different immune cell types, right? And they're matched by color code here. Okay, so it does find meaningful populations. Um, it's not just going to return a bunch of random cell types. Okay? Now, native options in SeekGeek, um, again, uh, these are probably a little bit more antiquated, but they, they were popular in the single cell field for a long time, and I do still see them used on occasion. Um, but that's going to be k-means. Um, and k-nearest neighbors. k-nearest neighbors is going to need a training set of data to learn from, which could be the same data you're using, or you could provide something else. But if you want something more completely unsupervised, um, a little bit more contemporary, we do have Phenograph available as a plugin. Okay, so this is going to construct communities through nearest neighbor graphs um, and essentially give you something like this, right, where each of these peaks represent a um, automatically gated cell population. Right, with each population within the gate being um, homogenous, right? So in this peak, this cluster, I'd say, right, all the cells in that cluster have a very similar transcriptome profile. And that profile is different from the neighboring cluster and the other neighboring cluster. Okay, so very homogenous within a cluster, but it's different from the other clusters, right? Which makes it its own kind of community. All right, and then at the end of the day, we want some kind of differential expression, right? So I have all these populations, but I need to know how they're different from one another, right? So we know that the um, phenograph tool has separated them because they're different from each other, but why are they different from each other and how can I get that information? Well, you can do this um, a number of ways in SeekGeek. A more manual approach would be to use kind of the uh, you know volcano plot function, um, which where you essentially are switching to gene view and you can have um, the pre-processing step here would be to have two different populations right and then make a comparison between those two right so here I'm looking at cluster four versus everything that is not cluster four right so cluster four versus cluster you know one through three and five through 15 right or something like that and then I can you know draw gates around genes that are either up or down um, when comparing those two populations. And you have a significance value to help you here. So here that's that threshold is at 0 0.05. Um, and this is an inverse scale, right? So as you go higher, more significant. Okay, so with a volcano plot, as you go leaning to the right, that means the gene is upregulated. And as it gets higher, it's of more significance, right? The left downregulated. As it goes higher, it's of uh, more significance. Okay? And so then once I have these gene sets, because remember a gate or in gene view makes gene sets, then I can do what we talked about earlier. I can export that gene set, do an enrichment on it, and see what is kind of making that cluster unique relative to the other clusters. Now, depending how many clusters you have and whether they're all interesting to you or not, right, this is going to be a lot of manual work, right? This is only cluster four versus everything. But if I have 30 clusters to go through, that's going to be a lot of volcano plots, a lot of enrichment analysis. Okay, so there are some pipelines to help with this and basically automates the view you're seeing here. We have ICELR that basically does this for you and gives you a list of uh, gene sets showing differential expression for each of your clusters. And then we have Surat, which is more of a full pipeline. Um, Surat does not only does differential gene expression, but it also does dimensionality reduction um, and clustering. And it gives you some images in the layout editor, like a heat map and um, 
some dimensionality reduced overlays showing your clusters. So Surat's more of a full pipeline. ISLR, um, I see it primarily used just for the differential gene expression. All right, and then we're ultimately going to want to present our results, right? And I think people are going to be less interested in views like this and more interested in something like this, right? So we want to be able to help with that and get you to those publication ready or, pu or presentation ready images. Okay, so in the layout editor, you'll have an opportunity to make heat maps. You can also do uh, dimensionality reduced overlays um, to show different genes of interest. We have plugins like Violinbox that can help you, you know, zone in on a particular gene of interest within a cluster and, you know, emphasize the, the differential expression there. Um, you can also do overlays um, for manually gated cell types and a lot of flexibility on color choice, shape, size, um, and even something as simple as a histogram. You can, you can say a lot with images like these. And there's also a number of statistics if you're interested in those as well. Um, and then, I mean, you know, in terms of plugins, I just mentioned Violin Box. If you want to quickly visualize some uh, differences in expression of a gene um, between di two different clusters or two different uh, populations. All right. So, talking about plugins, there's a lot that I'm just not going to have time to cover, um, but I do want to make it clear that the tools are out there for you um, for SeekGeek, right? So, questions we get often are, well, how do I do batch correction if I have um, different single cell runs and I want to make sure there's no batch effects, um, right? So, if you get something like the Tisney on the left, you might have a, a batch effect issue, right? Because you can see that these islands are separating um, by sample color here. Um, so, we have tools to help correct that as well. Um, we also have a variety of dimensionality uh, reduction tools. Um, I'll be showing TISNI today, but a reminder that there's a lot of other types. Um, clustering as well. Um, visualization, like with Violin Box, like I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, also, if you want to just visualize a gating hierarchy, um, you can do that with Sunburst and Mist. They make kind of like minimum spanning trees or radial plots to visualize gating trees. And also pipelines, right? So I talked about Surat and, and basically it, everything that it can do, starting with quality control all the way to visualization and all the steps in between. Okay, so if you want something more automated and you don't necessarily want your hands in every step of the process, um, you can funnel your data through this tool. It'll take some time to run, um, but I'll show you later what kind of outputs it gives you. And ISLR, I talked about that for differential gene expression. Monocle is going to be a pseudo time analysis tool. And VDJ Explorer is just a way if you've done um, TCR or BCR sequencing in your experiment, you can look at those clonotypes and form gates and, and make different visuals and statistics with that data. And we have webinars on probably most of these tools, if not all of them, um, where you'll get more of a deep dive into those. Um, as we're today, this is kind of an introduction to the software, but I'd encourage you to watch those webinars and I'll show you where you can find them if you're interested in any of these tools specifically. So learning resources, I'm gonna show you where to find these things on our website, but I just wanna give them a shout out. Um, you know, We do SeekGeek webinars a couple times a year and they get recorded. Okay, so if you miss it, you can't watch it live, you'll be able to watch a recording of it. We also have short video tutorials through Flojo University, so just short 5 to 15 minute videos in case you've forgotten how to do something. We have also a software manual online, okay, so it's not just like a giant 1000 page PDF, it's searchable like a website and you'll get screenshots and videos to help you with functionality. And if you want to take SeekGeek for a test drive, um, we offer a very generous trial, 60 days, right? And it even comes with demo data. So even if you don't have hands on your data yet, um, you can still take it for a whirl um, and see if it's going to suit your needs, right? And play around with it and get familiar with it before you decide to um, purchase or so you can practice pipelines um, before you get your data. And if you're ever having trouble with the software, um, you can contact our wonderful tech support team at SeekGeekFED.com. Um, they're a great group of folks, very knowledgeable, and they can help you with any issues you're having. All right, so I'm going to take a quick field trip to our website just to show you where you can find all of these learning resources. Um, and then after that, um, I'll go ahead and move into the software so we can kind of see you know, where all of this functionality is. Yeah. All right, so let's go to our website. 
right. So when we go to flowjo.com, you can go over to the download section. Um, and if you go to download SeatGeek, that's where you'll be able to download a trial. Um, and you can request a demo if you feel like you need it. And then if you go over to learn webinars, This is where you'll see all of our upcoming webinars, right, including the one you all are joining today. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see a recorded webinars button. When you select that, you'll see our library of recorded webinars. The one from today will show up right around here. Um, but you can see we also have some other previous intro to SeatGeek webinars. Um, so you can rewatch any content from one of our other application scientists, right? So we all take turns giving these webinars. So if you just want to hear it from a different approach, um, you can watch one of these other webinars. Um, and you'll see that some of our more advanced topics are going to be in there as well, right? So here's Surat, um, which is uh, our pipeline for single cell or multiomic analysis. Now, if you go to Flojo University, that's going to be the shorter videos. So here's SeatGeek, right? If you start here, you'll see the videos organized by topic, right? And when you open one of the cards, right, you'll see a handful of very short videos, right? Even one called SeatGeek in five minutes, right? So if you don't have a whole hour, you can give five minutes of your time. All right. And then lastly, we have SeatGeek software help, right? So this is going to be our searchable web manual, right? So you can come in type something of interest, right? So if I have an interest in heat maps, right, I'll come to that page and it'll give me just a series of screenshots and a little bit of um, copy to kind of help me navigate um, through that tool. Okay. And again, if you ever have any questions, you can write us at seekgeek at flojo.com. All right, so now that I have kind of shown you where all these resources are, let's go ahead and, and fire up the software here and get started. Okay, so I'm gonna open up a new workspace. So when you open up SeatGeek, right, what's gonna launch is what, again, is what's called the workspace, right? We have the activity ribbon at the top, the gene sets will show up here, samples, and then sample pane. Okay? In your preferences, right, you'll have a number of customizations you can do. Right, if you want to make your fonts bigger or smaller, customize the way your default gates look. Right, there's a lot of customization opportunities here. All right, so let's talk about loading some samples. Okay, so a couple of different ways to load samples. Right, the kind of the joke in the Flojo family is that there's like ten different ways to do the same thing in either SeatGeek or Flojo, um, and that goes for adding samples as well. Right, so you can say add samples. There's a big add samples button here. There's also a shortcut at the top of the activity ribbon. When you say add samples, then it's just going to open a native file explorer and ask you to navigate to the file you want to bring in. Okay. But you'll see there's a giant drag samples here notice, right, where you can also bring in the samples. So I'm going to do it that way. So when you download SeatGeek, as a trial and whether you purchase it as well, we actually give you some demo data to come with it. And that's what I'm going to be using today. So if you did want to repeat this workflow on this file, it's the exact same file that's in the demo data that we provide. Okay. So it's it's a pretty simple experiment, it's just 6,000 PBMC um, that have been run through um, some sequencing. So I'm going to go ahead and load that. Um, and while that's loading, I'll go ahead and make a plug here that I get often get asked what kind of files Seeky can take. Um, long story short is it needs to be what's called a matrix file, right? So it needs to be um, rectangular or I should say square in shape or I guess rectangular. Um, but essentially you need a row or a column for every cell and a row or a column for every read, right? For every transcript or every protein if you're doing ABSeq. Um, so you can't take like a FASTQ file for instance, and put that through here. Um, it needs to be a matrix file. So if you have um, a, co a company rep you're working with for your sequencing, you know, ask them about how to get a matrix file that's going to be compatible for um, this kind of an analysis platform. Yeah. All right. So now having brought in my file, okay, so you can see that's shown up here in the sample pane, and we can see it down here um, in the uh, population hierarchy area. So uh, First thing we'll do maybe is go ahead and, and also get the navigation out of the way. So, you know, we, we talked about the activity ribbon and the samples. So a reminder that when we open our file, 
right, just by doing a double click on the file name, that remember that we have two different views here, right? We have cell view where every, uh, or actually I probably should do the normalization first, but just to let you know that there's a cell view, right, where every, uh, is this in cell view? Why is it looking like that? There we go. There we go. Um, where every event is going to be a cell. Okay, so here we're looking at the expression of these two genes. And if we go to gene view, then we're seeing that every um, dot is going to be a gene, right? And so you can see that on my axes, I have populations, and I'm looking at genes. And here in the cell view, right, we're looking at cells. Okay, so just a reminder about the two different displays before we go too far. Oh, and I think we have a question in the chat. Let's take a peek. Is there any plugin to make a single file from 10x genomics, three different files, matrix, barcode, and feature? That is a good question. So with 10x data, typically the, the type of file I see is um, what's called a .h5, um, which I believe ends up being that first type of file you mentioned, which is the matrix file. Um, but I can uh, I can double check that for you. Um, let me see if I have that written in my notes real quick, because I know I've gotten that question before, uh, but I don't get a whole lot of 10x data, so it sometimes escapes my memory. Um, but yeah, typically you're going to need like a CSV file or a, a .h5 file. If you do use a matrix file, I believe you can load that individually, like if it's a .mtx. Um, but you have to just make sure that you have the, um, you need to have the other files kind of nearby, right? Like the barcode file and the, the, the genes, the feature file, right? But I think you can load the MTX file. But usually I see .h5 for um, 10x data, and that that is readable without any problems. And it should have all of the features that the software needs. Um, we ourselves do not have a plugin for that. Um, but I believe 10x has pipelines like through Cell Ranger and things like that, um, where they can generate that file for you. Right? So if you have a 10x uh, rep or application scientist that can help you, you just need to ask them for a way to get um, a matrix file or get a .h5 file, and you should be able to load it in SeekGeek just fine. And if you have any questions about that, um, feel free to send me an email, um, and I can give you more kind of technical specs for what the requirements are. Um, but that's basically all you would need. All right. All right. So um, we talked about cell view, gene view. So let's go ahead and get started with a workflow. And I'm going to go ahead and save this workspace just in case it disconnects on me. Let's go. Yeah. All right. So. First thing I'll probably want to get started with, right, is probably some kind of a, a normalization, right? So remember, in this case, I only have one sample, but if I had multiple samples, right, we're probably going to want to normalize them to the same scale. Um, and even if I did have just one sample, right, I only have 6,000 reads, so it's it's kind of hard to like do frequency math on that number. So if you normalize it, it to something more even or like that's divisible by 10, it's probably going to be more um, intuitive. So selecting that sample, we can go over to the um, Analyze tab and go to the Normalization platform. Once you do that, it's just going to ask you, you know, what are you wanting to normalize, right? And in this case, I want to do all of my genes, right? Now, if I had a ABSeq experiment, maybe I'd only want to do the RNA and not the protein. Um, but in this case, I'm going to just do all of the RNA. Right. What kind of normalization do I want to do? I'm going to do counts per 10,000, but you can see there's other options here. Right. So when I hit run, you can see that this symbol right now is kind of like a grayed out color. Right. But once I hit run and it finishes calculating, you can see that it's turned blue. Right. And that's just to remind you that you have done a normalization on this data. Right. Otherwise, it, it may be hard to tell if you've done it or not. Um, and also what kind of normalization it received. So once I've done that, next thing is I'm probably going to want to do a little bit of QC, right? Talking about those three platform windows that we um, went over in the presentation. So doing that, um, you can just select your sample, go over to the Analyze tab again, and go over to Quality Control, right? And that's going to launch three different windows here. Okay, so let's take them one at a time. First thing is we're going to want to focus on our quality cells. Okay, remember, we don't want cells stuck together, which would probably be up here somewhere, 
or cells that probably ruptured and that well is just a bunch of debris. Okay. Um, you know, tips and tricks, th this would be gateable. I wouldn't really have any issues with that. But if I did want to see kind of the comet at the bottom of this population, right, you could change this to say like a log axis, for instance. Right. And when I do that, it's maybe a little bit easier to see kind of the comet end of the bottom portion of that population. All right, a couple of different gating options here. So if you're familiar with Flojo, you'll see that right, there's a number of different gate shapes, right? Not, not one size doesn't fit all, right? So we've given you a variety of shapes here you can draw from. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just draw around what I find are my, you know, the bulk of what my good quality cells are. And you can really call this whatever you want. I'm just gonna call it quality cells. And now you can see that that population has shown up in my hierarchy, right? Because this is cell view. When we draw a gate around cells, we get a population, right? So there's the population hierarchy, right? Next filter is going to be on genes, okay? So a reminder that we want genes that are expressed by most of the cells, but probably not all the cells are too few, okay? I'm getting a warning here that some of my events are out of scale. So how can we fix that? Well, you could change this axis here. So instead of linear, you probably want to do something like log or log shift. Okay. All right, so when I'm in this view, it's a little bit easier to appreciate everything that's kind of falling off in um, frequency versus, you know, those very frequent across all the cells. Okay, so here in this case, you know, I'm going to do something a little bit more, um, maybe a little less strict because I, I don't want to cut too much data out. So I'll do something like that and I'll call this outlier gene filter. Right. Okay. And so when I've drawn that gate around genes, right, I've made a gene set. Where did that gene set go? Well, here it is. It's in my gene set pane, outlier gene filter, right? I've gone from, um, I'm not sure how many reads I had before, but let's say, for instance, if I did capture everything, right, I had like, let me make this gate bigger. All right, see how that number is 13,000. So I went from like 13,000 reads or so to after applying this filter, now it's gone down to right 9,000 reads. Okay, so I'm already making a funnel of my data so that I'm not you know overwhelmed with all of the transcripts here. Now, a common question I get from people is, well, what if I'm nervous about what's being cut out, right? Well, you've just seen that I can adjust this gate, but I can also keep an eye on this gene set and make sure that I didn't cut out something that I know I want to be there, right? So if I know that I have an interest in, um, uh, you know, TNF receptors, right? I can see that I preserved those TNF reads here. I can see how many total reads there are, how many cells are expressing it. Um, and if I don't see that gene there that I want, I can come back and just, um, you know, adjust that gate, okay? And you can sort by, you know, a, a variety of different ways. You can even go alphabetical, okay? If there's a particular gene you're looking for. Okay, so it's not permanent. You can always change it um, if it's been based on a gate. Okay. So next filter, right? We want things that are highly variable. Okay, but I've already applied one filter here. So in that last window, instead of all genes, we're gonna say outlier genes only because I already have that filter applied, right? If these dots are too hard to see in the display, you can draw larger dots, make it a little easier on the eyes. Okay, and then here we're looking at variability. So more variability. Right, more chance of finding differences between my populations and my sample. Okay, so if I want to capture, right, maybe, maybe being a little more generous and, and going towards the very tippy top of that population, and I'll call this right, highly uh, variable filter, right, whatever you want to call that. And again, making this gene set, it shows up here. Right, and now we're all the way down to 300 transcripts. Okay, so I'm really focusing my search here. And again, you know, maybe for some folks that's a little too strict and they're gonna wanna take everything or lower it a bit. Okay, but that is up to you and you can always adjust that gate, right? And again, I can see I preserved my TNF receptor, which was very interesting to me, right? And I can take a peek at all of the, the genes that are gonna be preserved in that analysis, right? Because ultimately we're gonna take this final gene set and that's what we're gonna use for our clustering and our dimensionality reduction. Okay, so I will say to try to be sure about where you want that gate um, before you start entering these pipelines. Okay, otherwise, if you do change your mind, you'll have to redo the pipeline. 
All right, so I always recommend at this step to go ahead and just copy these images to the layout editor while it's fresh in your mind, right? So you can go to file, or is it, I always forget which one it is. Edit, yeah, edit, right? Copy to layout editor, right? I'm gonna do the same thing here. Copy to layout editor, right? So what is the layout editor? It's basically this L-shaped button. Um, it launches on its own once I copy. Um, but if you need to get back to it, it's this L-shaped button that says Layout Editor. And it's basically a blank canvas where you can make reports, right? So here I can have a report, right? And I can double click this and name it something like QC, right? And that way when my collaborator or my PI asks me how I cleaned up these data, right? I can present these images and I can always have an idea of where I place those gates and see if we want to change them. Okay. So quick way to get that kind of a report, right? So now that I've done my cleanup, right, let's talk about moving forward with an analysis, okay? A quick way to get these out of the way, do file, close all graph windows, right? Those are all gone now. Um, now, before we get into, I guess, like the pipelines, right, what if you were going to do a little bit of a manual approach here, a little bit of manual gating? Um, I don't, I think manual gating on transcripts is not super useful, but if you did have antibodies, like an ABC component to your experiment, um, it can be a nice way to narrow down populations, right? So how would you do that? So you can launch your quality cell population here. While we're in cell view, I can change these to parameters. Now you're gonna have a lot of parameters in a single cell experiment, right? Way more than you'd have in a flow panel, okay? So we can't show you everything in the drop down. But if you say gene sets and genes, right, it basically opens kind of a side panel for either axes, right? And so let's say I have an interest in um, some kind of a, a T cell. So if I want to say CD3, right, here's my CD3 reads. And on the Y axis, perhaps I want to say CD4, right? I guess I don't have CD4. Let's, oh, there it is, CD4, okay? All right, so here's all of my cells expressing um, some degree of CD3 and CD4. Okay, again, if you're having trouble seeing the dots, you can make them larger. And again, when we make a gate in cell view, we're making a population. Okay, so those are CD4 T cells, right? Or I should say CD, because they're not really CD4 T cells. I mean, they are based on transcript, but an antibody would be better. But I'm going to call them CD3 expressing, CD4 expressing. Right? Now, if I have another population of interest, maybe I'll change that to CD8, for instance, okay, CD8 alpha. And again, I can do the same thing, right? This time, these are gonna be CD3 expressing, CD8 expressing. All right. So again, you can do some manual gating, and then later down the road, if you decide like, oh, I only want to run a pipeline on my CD8 expressing cells, right? You've gone down to 200 cells versus 6,000. Okay, so narrowing that search and getting more resolution there. Now, another reason someone might want to do this, um, whether they have antibodies or not, is to kind of do an example of what I showed you in the presentation, which is to find genes that are enriched in one population or another, right? So let's go ahead and do this again, where we're looking at um, CD4 expressing and CD8 expressing cells, but let's change it to gene view. And let's say I want my CD4 expressing here and my CD8 expressing there. So in this view, I can see which genes are more enriched in one population over the other, okay? Um, and now if I wanted to draw a gate around that, so let's go ahead and just say, I want the CD8 expressing ones, right? Maybe be a little more generous with that gate, okay? So I'm gonna say up in CD8 expressing over CD4 expressing, okay? And I'll say, okay, All right? And I'm not really picking very exciting cell types here, right? I think we've known for a long time what's different between CD4 and CD8 CT cells, but you know, if you had, um, you know, different cell types of interest, maybe like some kind of a, a TCR that you're interested in, whether it's a specific TCR versus another TCR, right, then you'd probably want to know what's upregulated in one of those versus the other, right? If you have some kind of activated T cell, right, maybe you want to know what's enriched in that T cell um, to, to find some kind of biomarker for that, right, in a, in a future study. So now I have this gene set, right, what's up in CD8 over CD4, 
right? And now I have that list of genes, right? Granzyme, no big surprise there. CD8 and CDB, CD8B, also no big surprise. Okay, but I can look at some other transcripts, right? I can put them alphabetically, right? So this is what's called an analytical gene set, right? So I made this based off a of gate, right? But you can also make static gene sets. So let's say, for instance, I see a lot of granzyme here, and I know that I'm going to be interested in granzyme at some point in my analysis. I can close this, and I can go to genes, new static gene set, right? And I'm going to call this granzyme. And um, you know you can use one of your filters. So if, if I'm only interested in granzyme genes that were up in CD8 or just all granzyme genes in general, whether they're up or down in any of my populations, right? Here's all the ones that are in my sample, right? Doesn't mean I that they're enriched in any of these filters. They're just present in the sample. Add these, right? Save. Now I have a gene set of only granzyme genes. So if I'm ever in my analysis, right, and I'm back in cell view. And I want to just quickly look at my granzyme expressing genes. I now have a gene set for that, right? And you can see because I've made that, right? There's my granzyme genes. I can quickly navigate between them. I can even do a sum operation, right? So if I know that I'm interested in granzyme and um, I just want to know the total granzyme expression, right, for all of these, right, I can take those and apply a sum operation, right? All of these genes here. Right, and now I have the sum of granzyme expression, right? So that doesn't mean it's any one gene in particular, but all the genes in my granzyme set. Okay, so that's pretty common for like mitochondrial analysis if people just want to find cells that are expressing a lot of mitochondrial genes and they don't care which one in particular. Okay. All right. So again, this is all a bit manual. Okay, so if we want to start delving into these computational pipelines, you know, how do we get started? Okay, so let's get started with the dimensionality reduction. So we'll do a TISNI, um, but what I recommend you do first is a kind of pre-dimensionality reduction with principal component analysis, because that's going to just kind of pre-digest the data before it goes into the TISNI. Okay, so when you select your population, you can launch the dimensionality reduction platform, and we're going to start with a PCA first. Okay, then it's asking me, well, which genes do you want to do the reduction on? Okay, so again, we already did these filters, so I don't probably want to do everything, but instead I only want to do, right, the highly variable genes that we filtered for, the 300 that showed very large differences. So I'm going to select those, right, hit run, and just take a second here. All right, now once it's done, you'll have some decisions to make, right, as a researcher. Do you want to take all the principal components or only some of them, right? It made 25, but I may not need all 25, right? There's different schools of thought. Some people will take everything, right? They don't want to sacrifice any data. Some people will say, I don't care how many it gives me. I only want the first 15. And some will only take the ones that go uh, above 1% variance, okay? So for the sake of speed, I'm going to pick the first 15, but I'll show you why it is that people wouldn't want to pick maybe the last ones, or they wouldn't want to waste their time on it, I should say. Okay, so I'm going to go with 15. All right, so it's giving me the 15 different components, right? Here's component one versus component two, right? I can see these populations or these islands are very separated from one another. But if I go lower, right, let's look at 15 versus 14. It's kind of a smear. And so as you start getting in those lower PCAs, or I should say higher number PCAs, um, you're, you're not going to have as much variance between the components. Right. So that's partially why you know, some folks don't want to take the, the lower part of the analysis, or I should say the components with the higher numbers. Right? So up to you, um, but just for the sake of today, I'm going to go with 15. And I'm not going to do really anything else with these other than go right into a TISNI. So let's launch the dimensionality reduction again, but this time I will leave it as TISNI. I personally keep all the defaults, right? The only thing I, I change is the speed implementation, right? So doing an approximate calculation and a fast Fourier transform is going to, as the name would imply, take less time um, than doing an exact calculation. Okay? Um, and you can read more about this here and on our website, um, but the, there are speed implementations and you can read about the caveats of them. Um, there's also an OPSNI configuration I recommend as well. 
Now here's where you're going to change, right? So it says select genes, right? Do you want to do all the genes? Well, probably not, right? We just ran that principal component analysis. So what I'm going to do is go over to parameters and basically search for my PCAs, right? I should have 15. There they are. I'm going to add those. And this is what I'm going to run the TISNI on, right? So I'm going to select those parameters, right? I just kind of beefed up the speed here. Go ahead and say run. I know, just take a second. But once it's done, you'll basically see a two-dimensional rendering of the of those, or I should say of all of these cells in that sample. Okay. And that doesn't mean you can't see all of the genes that are in the sample, but it used only the highly variable genes to render the image. Okay. So we can take quick peeks at that, right, by changing this to a heat map statistic. And it, look at a gene of interest, right? So I have an interest in granzyme that I've already said a few times. So I could say granzyme sum, right? So here's where the cells that have the most total granzyme gene set expressed. But if I have another gene in mind, right, like specifically granzyme B, right, I can see that I have an island of granzyme B expression there. Um, and again, you can go into your highly variable filter, right, and start looking at all of these genes that might be of interest to you. Now, some common displays, right? If you go into your layout editor, you can bring in that quality cell population, that TISNI. And if you right click, you can do multi graph overlays, multi graph color mapping, and pick cells, or I should say, pick genes of interest, right? So, again, if I have an interest in granzyme genes, right? So then I quickly get this kind of global map of where all my granzyme expression is, right? And so I know that maybe this island is gonna be of interest to me because that's where all of my granzyme expressing cells are. Okay. Um, now, if you do have populations that you've gated, whether that's um, manually um, with the transcripts or because you had um, antibodies in your experiment, right? You can also do an overlay of some kind, right? So there's the, get this going here. All right, it's a little hard to see because those events are kind of rare, but maybe if I make this a more dull color, right, you can always hover over the legend and change the color. All right, then I can kind of see where my uh, CD8 expressing and CD4 expressing cells are. Let me make it a little bit bigger. All right, so there's not a whole lot, but you can see that most of my CD8 expressing cells are in this island. Right, maybe if I go to the properties, I can change some of the there we go, use large dots, let's do that. There we go, that's a little easier to see. So you can see that all my cells are there in gray, right? CD4 expressing in blue, CD8 expressing in orange, right? I can always change the color of that if I don't like it. And so it's becoming obvious to me, right, that my CD8 cells are kind of overlaying with where the granzyme expression is, okay? So you can do a variety of visualizations here. Um, but I think ultimately, right, if you're going to become interested in populations, uh, clustering is probably going to be the, the best tool there, right? So let's go ahead and just move into clustering. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly show you the other two pipeline outputs. I won't run the pipeline because it, it takes like 20 or 30 minutes, but I'll show you, you know, how you can automate that. So we'll be wrapping up here in less than 10 minutes. Okay, so taking that population, okay, this time we're going to... Uh, go over to our now I should say again we do have native whoops native uh, clustering tools available okay so if you go into clustering you can do k-means or k-nearest neighbors uh, the k-means it you know, just runs on its own the k-nearest neighbors is going to want some kind of a training population which can be the same sample um, but it does need something to kind of reference now, if you want completely unsupervised, you can use Phenograph, which is um, probably my favorite. So that is available as a plugin on the Flojo Exchange. So in that case, right, you'll go over to Workspace, Plugins, and launch Phenograph. Okay, so here it's going to ask, well, what do you want to run the clustering on? Okay, so you could either run it on the principal components, or you could run it on your maybe highly variable filter. Right, so kind of up to you. I, I'm not really sure. I think the jury's kind of out on whether it's better to do it on the highly variable genes themselves, or to just select your principal components and do it do it on those. 
right? So if I look for those, right? So here's my principal components if I decide to do it on that. Um, so, you know, again, up, up to the researcher, I think you'll get similar results. And then that's pretty much it. So let's say I do decide to do it on the highly variable genes, right? So I, I have that, I'm gonna pick all of them. I would just hit okay. Um, and this is gonna take five or 10 minutes to run, okay? But when it's done running, let me show you what you get. Not this one, let's do this one. There we go. Okay, this is what you get, right? You can see my population here, right? I've got 19 different clusters that the tool found um, automatically, okay? Um, now, what can you do with those? What kind of visuals can you start making? Right. Well, you can bring in your again, open up the layout editor. Right. You can bring in that Tisney. Let's change this axis to Tisney. Oops. Right. So there's my Tisney from this run. Here's my clusters. I'm going to just do a quick overlay, right? Let me zoom in so we can see better. Okay, so here's all my different clusters, right? So this isn't quite the exact same um, Tisney from the previous run, right? Every time you do Tisney, it's going to look a little bit different, um, but it, it looks almost the same. And so I could start to see that in that area where I had that granzyme expression, I've got this purple cluster, right? Cluster number seven. So that's looking like a good candidate for some kind of a cluster of cells that expresses, um, you know, all of those granzyme genes that I'm really interested in. Okay. Oh, question in the Q&A. Can we import several gene set from publication and see the distribution of those gene sets on my Tisney plot? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I believe you can import gene sets um, into SeekGeek. Um, I'm trying to think though, if you can use them in the actual analysis though. Um, I know people import gene sets to use them as a reference for a gene set enrichment. Um, I think what the probably the better approach would just be to import the data itself, if that's what you're asking. But you can import the data itself if it's expressing all of those genes. Um, and then you could always make gene sets of interest manually, like I've shown either with the gate or with the static gene set. Um, but if you did just want to do a gene set enrichment, yeah, you can import gene sets from from other sources. That's a good question. Oh, let me mark it as answered. Okay. All right, so that's, you know, again, quick visuals that you can do. Um, now, again, ultimately, we're probably going to want some kind of a differential gene expression, right? So for instance, if I knew that that uh, I was interested in that cluster seven, right, because of the granzyme localization, um, what I could do is, right, select that cluster, right, and say something like, oh, if I go into gene view, I want to know how cluster number seven, right, is, um, you know, how it compares. All right, let me make this feel like it's not big enough here. There we go. Right, how it compares to maybe, let's just say cluster one, right? Maybe I want to just do a comparison between seven and one. Um, I could also launch this up down button, which is like a volcano plot, basically. Right. And now that I've opened up this volcano plot, I can see right what's up in, and I always forget which one ends up being the comparator. Let me just double check before I say something incorrect. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I think that the Y ends up being the comparator, right? So you're basically looking at what's up in uh, what's on the x-axis, so what's up in cluster seven relative to cluster one, right? Um, and I think if you hover over this, maybe it'll say, but in any case, so what's up in cluster seven versus cluster one, right? Um, so when you do that, you can look at up or down, right? That's how a volcano plot typically works. And then you have the significance value on the left, right? So p-value 0.05, this is an inverted scale, right? That means the numbers are getting, or I should say the p-value is getting smaller or more significant as you go up, okay? So if I wanted to, I could draw a gate like this and say, oh, this is everything that's up in seven 
right? Versus uh, what was the other one I picked? I think it was one. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna do something like that. Right, and here's that list of genes. Okay, so up in seven versus one. So what do I do with this now, right? So I have all these genes, but maybe half of them, I don't know what they are. Okay, you can take that and you could do an enrichment test. Okay, but what I typically do is I, especially if I don't even have a, a data base to uh, compare to, right, you can export that and I'm just gonna do a CSV file. Okay, I'll open it in another screen. Okay, so I'm gonna save that to the desktop, right? Say it's up in seven versus one. Right. Now there's that file, okay, just a CSV file. Now, if you go to some kind of online resource, right, and now I, I'll show you one just that only because I know that it's free, uh, but there's probably other ones up there. Um, I think it's like called Panther, right? When you come in here, you can basically import that file, right? So let's go ahead and grab it, choose file, right? It was on my desktop, right? There's that gene set I was interested in. So there's the file, right? It's asking species, right? Um, I, I like to do the one that gives you the bar chart or the pie chart. Okay, and when I hit submit, it's basically going to run, run through that list of genes and tell me what it's enriched for, right? So in this case, it's, it's grouping it by molecular function. So in that list of genes I gave it, it's seeing um, some genes for a lot of red, looks like binding, okay? Um, now, if you want something a little more specific, you could do something like pathway, Right, so here I see a lot of this red. What's that? Apoptosis signaling pathway. So if I hit open that, I can see kind of what set that hit off, right? So it sees this gene um, lymphotoxin beta. Okay, so that's why it got a hit on that pathway, right? If I go back, I can do some more exploration. I see some yellow here for T cell activation. Okay, so here's all of the genes listed in that gene set that kind of are hinting towards some kind of T cell activation. Okay. So you can navigate there and start to, to kind of get some kind of an idea of what, you know, what those genes are trying to tell you. Okay. Now, this was just for one cluster, right? But that's going to get overwhelming if I have, you know, 15 clusters to go through. Okay. So I, meant, I mentioned we have plugins to help you with that. So this was the manual way to do it. Now, if you selected that population, and went over to workspace plugins. Uh, we have ICELR, right? So if you do differential expression, right, it's just going to open up a dialog and tell you uh, well, which genes do you want to compare, right? Maybe I want the highly dispersed ones, right? Which which clustering tool did you use, right? In this case, we used Phenograph, right? Whoops, why isn't it? There it is. Right? I did my Phenograph clusters. Um, and then here you can set some thresholds if you want, right? I only want genes that are twofold different and only if they're 0 0.01 significance, right? So again, this is going to take some time to run. So I'm going to not run it, but instead just show you what comes out when you do, right? So when you run it, this is basically what you want. You're going to get these two lists up here, downregulated, upregulated. Here you're looking at all the genes downregulated in cluster 10, downregulated in cluster 11, 12, 13, et cetera. Right. You can always open the gene set to see what's in it and then export it right? by right-clicking, do an export, right? do an enrichment test, or do uh, an enrichment test online. Same for upregulated. Here's everything upregulated in each cluster. Okay, So this is going to save a lot of time instead of doing it um, manually with the volcano plot like I just showed you. All right, so if only one or two clusters is interesting to you, the manual way is certainly fine, um, but it's going to take some time if you're going to want to go through all of them. Now, in talking about pipelines, right, everything we've done up until now has been fairly manual, right? But we have a pipeline called Surat that basically does normalization, quality control, dimensionality reduction, clustering, and differential gene expression, okay? So again, not going to run that because it, it's going to take some time, but let me show you what it, what it can do for you and where you find it, right? So again, you have your file. This is a plugin available on the Flojo Exchange. Right, you go over to Surat. Multimodal is if you have um, an ABC component. Okay, but if you don't, you can just say Surat pipeline. Right, similar questions. Right, which parameters do you want to use? Do you want to set thresholds for the quality control? Right, if this seems intimidating to you, you could just not do the quality control and do it manually in SeekGeek like we just went through. Do you want a UMAP or a TISNI? Right. Um, and then uh, let's see uh, some other you know 
tunables you can do down here if you're familiar with those numbers. Um, otherwise, you can leave the defaults. All right, and then you'll hit OK. Um, this one will take long to run. Um, I, I plan on at least 20 or 30 minutes, depending how many parameters you have. But here's what you get. You get your clusters. Right? In this case, it found 11 clusters. You get your down-regulated genes within each cluster, up-regulated genes within each cluster, just like ISLR does. And in the layout editor, you get some output images. There's my UMAP with all of my clusters overlaid on top. Right, you also get some RNA counts. Right, and I thought I had one with a heat map I was trying to find for you. Maybe I don't have it. Ah, oh, there we go. Right, and you also get this heat map, right, showing each of the uh, genes that I put into the run, color coded, um, clustered here. Um, or I should say the heat maps clustered by the clusters from the return of the run, um, and the clusters are color coded, and you can see the legend here on the right. And then we're just looking at a kind of pink yellow axis for um, log expression. Okay. So all of this in you know, a couple clicks of a button, um, you know, take some time to run. So if you decide to change some of the tunables, you'll have to be prepared to wait. Um, but it definitely gives a, a strong level of automation. Um, and these are a lot of the same pipelines that our coders use when they're dealing with single cell RNA-seq data. Um, but in SeqGeek, we know we want to give you the ability to have some kind of a manual handling of the data, um, but also pipelines, if, if that's what you're interested in. All right, I see there's a question. Is it possible to handle more than two groups together and examine each genotype information later? Example, differential express genes of each cluster, knockout versus wild type. That is a good question. Yes, I've purposely picked a single sample here for this demo because I, you know, I find that people get overwhelmed um, if I you know, try to have too much going on. But essentially, yes, what you would what that would require typically is that you confine all of your samples. So let's say I have a knockout mouse and a wild type mouse. I'd still need to analyze them in a single file, um, but they need to be annotated in some way um, to separate them later. Right. So long story short, if you have a single .h5 file and the two samples are annotated in some way, right, we can separate them out in the software. Or you can bring in the two separate files and we can concatenate them or merge them and then um, give them some kind of a, an identifier when we merge them. And that way we have the merge file so that they go into the same pipeline analysis together. But within the merge file, we can um, separate them out in the exact same way that I would separate out um, you know, CD4 or CD8 T cells, right? We just do that with some gating. Um, and I think in some of our ABSEQ webinars, um, on that webinar page I showed, those were a bit more intricate analyses, right, where there's um, different uh, donors that have been maybe multiplexed. And so in that demo, I know the speaker probably talks more about comparing multiple samples instead of comparing multiple populations in the same sample. Um, but I think the, the short answer is yes, um, but you still have to have them merged for all of the computational tools. And that is pretty much it. Um, I don't think I have anything more planned for the demo, and I, and I see we're kind of running short on time here. Um, I, I'll open the floor for any other questions. I'll hang on for a minute. Perhaps in the meantime, I'll go ahead and put up my email one final time here. And again, if you have any questions, follow up, you come into some data and you're trying to put it in SeekGeek and you're, you're getting a little lost or overwhelmed, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to help. Um, and you can always, again, download that trial and give it a whirl and play with some of the demo data that we provide there. All right, well, not seeing any questions, so I'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, after I stop the recording, I'll hang on for an extra minute or two just in case. Um, otherwise, I'll wish you all a good uh, afternoon or evening, depending where you are in the world. I hope this seminar was useful for you and that you're absolutely inspired to tackle your own single cell data, and I hope that you'll reach out if you need any help. Don't forget the webinar is recorded. You can always rewatch it. Um, and. It was nice interacting with all of you today. Thank you.